Greetings and God's blessing. This is Father John Karapi with another episode of Weekly Wisdom. Uh, we are uh, broadcasting this during Lent, so I thought a very timely topic uh, for us to cover would be concerning uh, penance and sacrifice, uh, what it means and how to do it. Uh, you know, penance and sacrifice uh, have always been uh, what you could call essential threads woven into the very fabric of being Catholic and Christian. Uh, when I was a boy, the rather profound uh, theology of the church was summed up by my grandmother in the very concise saying, offer it up. Uh, in those three words, actually, the essence, uh, the substance of my doctoral thesis was captured, offer it up, uh, the meaning of Christian suffering and sacrifice. Uh, it's a very profound thing. It's an essential thing. And I'm afraid that over the years, uh, just in my lifetime, let's say over the last half a century, uh, I'm afraid we've lost uh, a lot of that sense of the importance of penance and sacrifice in our Catholic and Christian life. Uh, it really is essential. And one might say, well, why? Well, because of the reality of sin. We're all sinners. And uh, sin requires a certain um, uh, compensation. Jesus said, every penny will be paid. And he's referring to sin. Uh, somebody might say, well, Jesus paid the price on the cross. Indeed, he did. But we have to accept it. And that's the crux of the matter. We have to accept the grace of redemption. Uh, it's one of those situations that can be summed up <laughs> by the old saying, you know, put your money where your mouth is. Uh, we say we have faith. Let's see the actions that prove that faith. Uh, sin, and we're all sinners. We know that. We're all sinners. We all commit sins. Uh, certain satisfaction or atonement is required. Uh, yes, indeed, Jesus uh, made atonement, infinite atonement, uh, on the cross for our sins. We have to accept that grace. Uh, we, the, the servants are no better than the master, Jesus said. And so, if Jesus, who is without sin, uh, became sin, in the words of Scripture, uh, for us, he had no sins uh, of his own. He took upon himself all of our sins, uh, the sins from beginning to end, from the original sin to the last sin that will ever be committed before Jesus comes again in glory. We have to atone for sin. Part of the way we do this is penance. Now, during Lent, uh, we call this to mind, um, I would say, more intensely. Um, we try to do penance, make some sacrifices, almsgiving, and so forth. Uh, it's very, very important. Um, because of this reality of sin, then, uh, we should uh, foster in ourselves um, a, a spirit of sacrifice. Now, it doesn't have to be big things. One of the greatest saints in the history of the church, uh, St. Therese of Lisieux, the little flower, um, she often said, I'm not capable of doing big penances like the saints of old. Um, all I can do is little things. And she developed out of that very simple um, idea her little way, which eventually uh, resulted in her being named a doctor of the church. Uh, doctors of the church are few and far between, only 33 of them in the entire history of the church. And St. Therese is one, and she largely became a doctor of the church because of her teaching in the spiritual life, especially on the little way, which can basically be summed up, do little things with great love. You don't have to do grand, huge penances. Uh, don't bite off more than you can chew, so to speak. Do little things, but do them. You must do them. We have to have some element of sacrifice in our life if we want our prayer to have any power at all. You know, prayer alone is good. But prayer from a contrite, humble heart is better. Um, 
prayer from a person who acknowledges the reality. Um, you don't beat yourself up about it. But yes, I am a sinner. I'm sorry. And then in consideration of that, I'm not just going to be all talk and pay lip service uh, to that reality. I'm going to do something about it. So you, you offer little things, little penances. Um, penance can be many things. Of course, you know, during Lent we know about fasting and abstinence. Uh, those things uh, as ex external penances um, still uh, have um, a great standing in the church. That's why we, uh, on the Fridays of Lent, um, we abstain from eating meat on, on Ash Wednesday and Good Friday. We, uh, we also have fasting where we eat less. Uh, as well as abstaining from meat. Um, Pope Paul VI uh, wrote a, uh, a document called um, uh, Penitimini. That, that, that's a, uh, an apostolic constitution uh, on penance, and it's really the most significant document uh, on penance in modern times. Um, that's where the change came, by the way, uh, you remember how uh, we never used to eat meat on Friday? That was a little penance that the church used to do for many years. All the years I was growing up as a young boy in the Catholic Church, we didn't eat meat on the Fridays of Lent. Um, this constitution, um, Penitimini, uh, changed the discipline. Um, now, all most people remember from that whole thing was that, oh, now we can eat meat on Friday. Uh, no, that was not the substance of it. That's kind of what came across, but that, that wasn't the substance of it. What Paul VI wanted to do with that is he wanted to uh, make an assertion to the church as to what penance really is. First and foremost, it's interior. Uh, it's not just an external work. Yes, the external works are noble things. They're good. But first of all, you have to have the interior disposition of penance. In other words, you have to have that interior disposition of conversion, conversion of heart. In some of the readings early in Lent, um, uh, we're reminded that, that the kind of fasting God wants is fasting from sin, first and foremost. You know, get rid of sin first. You know, you can fast and not eat meat until you're blue in the face. But if you don't cut the link with sin first, you know, you're whistling Dixie. <laughs> that, that's, not, that's not the kind of fasting God wants. So interior conversion is what Pope Paul VI was pointing out in this very important uh, apostolic constitution, Penitimini. Um, where, where, and, and so what do you, what do, you do? Uh, go to confession, um, first and foremost, Make a break with your favorite sins, and we all have them. You know the ones they are? The ones that you confess every time over and over and over again. We all have them. Make a break with that. Uh, interior conversion, metanoia, that Greek word, um, you know the word. It, it, it's the, uh, the one that's the, uh, the basis for that, that word metamorphosis. You know how a um, caterpillar changes into a butterfly change. Uh, change from one thing to another. Change from a lower thing to a higher thing. Change of heart, meaning break with sin and be moved by grace. Then, once we have that interior disposition to break with sin, then external acts of penance uh, to take on some power. Uh, fasting, when it flows from that, that um, interior penance. Uh, fasting is, is very, very important. If you, you fast along with your prayer, uh, assuming you have the right interior disposition, um, it'll be more powerful. And that's in the long-standing spiritual tradition of the church. That's nothing new. Uh, we know that. Uh, so, here's what the church says. The church is by divine vocation holy, indefectively holy, uh, but it is defective in her members. You know, we often hear the, um, the comment, 
from people, oh, the Catholic Church isn't holy. Yes, the Catholic Church is indefectibly holy. Why? Because of me? No. Because of you? No. Because of Christ, who is the head of the church, and because of the Holy Spirit, who is the soul of the church. The Holy Spirit, the one who breathes life, the Lord and giver of life. That's why the church is holy, because of Christ the head and the Holy Spirit, the soul of the church. The members of the church are defective because of sin. We're flawed, all of us. We're all sinners, and so we're in need of doing penance. We're in need of, of repentance, um, contrition, just, I'm sorry, Lord. You know, uh, that in order to receive the grace of redemption, and this is, this is key, listen to this, in order to receive the grace, the infinite grace made available through the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ, you must have that spirit of contrition in order to receive it. You can't receive it unless you're disposed to receive it. And that means sorrow for sins with a firm purpose of amendment. And for Catholics, that means any um, serious or mortal sins after baptism, you have to take them to the sacrament of reconciliation or penance confession. Uh, so, the church is by vocation. By vocation, the church is holy. Why? Because of Christ, her head, and because of the Holy Spirit, the soul of the church. Uh, it is defective in its members and in continuous need of conversion and renewal. Now, that means all the members of the church, but that means you in particular and me in particular. We, personally, are in need of constant renewal, uh, constant conversion. Uh, the church uh, in, in that document by Paul VI uh, says that uh, penance must not only be external, which we said, uh, but also flow from an interior disposition uh, of, of wanting to please God, of being sorry for our sins, of having a, a firm purpose of amendment, of doing good and avoiding evil, the basic moral precept. Um, we do penance for our own sins, because we have them, uh, and also for the sins of others. Now, remember this. We're made in the image and likeness of God. Who's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, according to Scripture? Jesus. Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. He is the model. Now, he didn't have any personal sins. But what did he do? He atoned for the sins of the whole world. He made it possible for us to be forgiven. We, for our part, have to accept that grace. Now, not just for ourselves, because if, if we're going to follow Jesus, we have to care about other people. And one of the, the most noble, one of the highest ways of caring about people of loving people, this is authentic love that I'm talking about here, uh, is to care about the souls of other people. Now, I can say, you know, I, I hope you live a thousand years. I hope you're never sick. I wish you prosperity and wealth and every good thing. I hope you never have trouble with your children and your grandchildren. Yeah, I wish you all those good things. Uh, but that would be next to useless unless I wished you to be in heaven forever. Now, it's one thing to wish something, it's another thing to do something about it, okay? Um, my job as a priest, and actually your job as a Christian, is not only to get ourselves personally into heaven, uh, certainly we have to do that, but it's to get as many other souls as possible up there, to take them with us. You know, starting with our own family members. And let me tell you something. If you haven't figured it out by now, you're not going to do it with talk. You're not going to preach a sermon and have your children and your grandchildren convert as the result of it. You know, that may be a noble aspiration, but in my experience, ain't going to happen. How do you do it then? Prayer and penance. You know, if I love you, if I really love you, and I do, I want you in heaven for all eternity. 
and everything else is baloney. That's the only thing that matters. You know, you can, you can, if you gain the whole world, as Scripture says, and lose your eternal salvation, what does it profit you? Zero. That's what it profits you. And so the important thing, get to heaven. The important thing is to get as many of our, uh, of our relatives and friends there. Now, how do you do it? Prayer and penance. That's how you do it. Prayer and penance, which will enable you to act in a virtuous manner in your life. It will enable you to walk on that narrow path that leads to heaven rather than the broad path that leads to hell. Listen, that's how simple this is. This is not rocket science, folks. This is very, very simple. I've said it a million times in the course of my ministry. What really matters is the end result. And there are only two, ultimately. Heaven, hell. Victory, defeat. That's it. Purgatory? Hey, you get to purgatory, you've made it. Everybody who goes to purgatory goes to heaven. And so, that's it. And we have to be concerned about our, our relatives, our friends, children, grandchildren. Priests have to be concerned for their flock, for the parish, and so forth. Um, and if you're concerned, you will pray, pray, and pray some more. But in order to make your prayer more powerful, more efficacious, you will join your prayer with penance. Penance. Now, what really is penance? Well, it can be a lot of things. It can be sacrifice. You know, you can uh, uh, renounce some licit pleasure. Uh, for instance, uh, it's not a sin um, to eat chocolate, uh, but you may, you may love chocolate. You may be a chocoholic, and you may decide that um, in order to do a little penance, in order to make a sacrifice, uh, and, and you're not, don't do it as an empty sacrifice. It has to flow from inside because you want to be a better son or daughter of God. You want to please God. You want to uh, be involved in the salvation of soul. So you, you have the right interior disposition, then that external act. So I, 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 I won't eat chocolate um, for Lent. Now let me tell you my observation on Lent. If you can do it for 40 days, you can do it for a lifetime. Uh, Lent is a proving ground, as far as I'm concerned. You know, it, it should help you to make, in the jargon of the world, lifestyle changes. In other words, if you're doing things like smoking, you know, you could quit for Lent. You know, you could do that. Um, in the first place, it, it's good for your health. In the second place, you're making a sacrifice pleasing to God, okay? Because for one thing, you're, 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 you're vowing to get rid of of a sin against the fifth commandment, uh, which nowadays it is because of the health damage that it causes. Or chocolate, or maybe you eat too much, like me. I eat way more than I need to. And so I can, I can, what I can say, and I have, is I'm going to cut down on, now chocolate's no big temptation for me. Uh, sweets, I never really had, I, I like them, but I, I don't eat sweets. I never, even when I was a kid, I didn't eat sweets very much. Uh, but pasta, ooh, linguine and clam sauce, now you're talking. Uh, now that, for me, would be a sacrifice uh, to give that up, say, for Lent. Or I'm not going to eat, you know, pasta for Lent. Or, like I've done, I said, well, I'm going to do it like I did in old days, only on Sundays, you know. There is a an element of sacrifice in that. You're foregoing a legitimate pleasure uh, in order to make a sacrifice. And, and if you don't think it's a sacrifice, try it, and you'll find out. As soon as you give something else, watch what happens. Uh, you know, that, that whatever it is you gave up, it could be hamburgers, chocolate, um, you know, whatever it is, ice cream, uh, you'll, it, after about a week or so, the cravings for it will be more intense than ever. Oh, that's partly not natural, psychological, and the devil gets involved too. Don't think that he doesn't. He doesn't want you to have that, sacrifice, that, that, that um, 
disposition of sacrifice and penance, discipline. Uh, one of the elements of doing penance is discipline. It's of enormous importance. One of the key uh, tactics of the devil today is to destroy discipline. Destroy discipline in individual human beings. Break down a discipline. Self-discipline, first and foremost, you know. Uh, I, I've seen people dying from cancer and emphysema on oxygen, sneaking cigarettes in the hospital. Smoking cigarettes in the hospital, hooked up to oxygen. They couldn't, and number one, not only are they killing themselves, they could blow themselves sky high, you know, yet they do it. Why? No discipline whatsoever. In other words, they're slaves. They're slaves. The same thing can happen in, in anything. You know, it can be with anything. If you can't readily quit it for a month, then you're probably addicted to it. And, and you can be addicted to anything, you know. We, nowadays, we hear just about drug addiction. and Yeah, that's a terrible addiction. You can be addicted to all kinds of things. You know, I, um, I have high blood pressure, and I drink coffee, which is not a good thing to do if you have high blood pressure. And so I said, okay, I'm not going to drink coffee anymore. Uh, and then I haven't, and, and, I, and I won't. Uh, but what happened? Just like a drug addict has withdrawal symptoms, that's what happens. Withdrawal symptoms, you know, uh, caffeine is a drug. Now, I'm not saying you can't drink coffee. I'm not saying that. But, but what happens is we get addicted to all kinds of things. Um, withdrawal symptoms from caffeine, headache, you can have a terrible headache, insomnia, uh, irritability, those are classic drug withdrawal symptoms, okay? So, penance has a, has a side benefit. Not only is it spiritually efficacious and adds power to your prayers, it's also good for what ails you. As my grandma used to say, it's good for what else? You know, it's good for your health. Self-discipline. You know, you know what you ought to do. You know what you should eat and shouldn't eat. You know if you're eating too much chronically. You know if you're drinking too much, smoking too much, whatever it is. Whatever it is. That discipline that we gain from doing penance is very, very helpful, not just spiritually, but in a natural sense, too, because then we gain mastery over ourselves and we become the master of our own destiny rather than have something else moving us toward physical or emotional illness. The church invites every person to accompany that inner conversion or metanoia of the spirit with the voluntary exercise of penance, whether, it, whether it's fasting. You know, most of us in this culture could afford to eat less, you know. Um, people commit suicide by jumping off bridges, by shooting themselves, by taking overdoses of medication. But one of the most deadly weapons is the fork. Uh, we're eating ourselves to death. And, uh, hey, look, I'm, I'm not one of those people that wants to, uh, you know, control how many calories people Eat. I'm just saying that if you exercised some of this self-discipline, you'd probably be not only healthier, but happier. And, and, and it can have spiritual benefits. You know, that's the biggest thing, is that there's spiritual power in this self-denial. The uh, document, Penitimony, talks about three classes of persons doing penance, and or makes commentary. The first one is, is very, very important. That's the one most important for you and me. The church insists, first of all, that the virtue of penitence be exercised in persevering faithfulness to the duties of one's state in life, in the acceptance of the difficulties arising from one's work and from human coexistence, 
in a patient bearing of the trials of earthly life and of the utter insecurity which pervades it. And how much more so today that's true than, say, when the Holy Father wrote those words. Um, um, life is utterly insecure. Um, there seems to be no security anymore. Very little job security, economic security, health security, you know, just to, very insecure. The first and foremost way to do penance is this, to accept the trials and difficulties which your state in life brings. Now, Mom, you know about that. Uh, raising children, taking care of them, all the, 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 the heartaches, the difficulties, the anxieties, you know, you, you do the best you can, then you send them out into a toxic world, a morally toxic world, and you suffer. You have anxiety because of that. Um, do the best you can. Offer it up. What does that old saying mean, offer it up? It means take the trials and tribulations, uh, the sacrifices, the sufferings that you are experiencing in your life, Unite those to Jesus. Unite those to Jesus crucified and risen. Um, in other words, your sacrifices are one with his. You know, from the day you were baptized, your suffering and your sacrifice took on new meaning because you're one with Christ. And so that dimension of penance is the most important one. Uh, for me as a priest, you know, um, I have to live alone. Uh, I can't have a wife. I can't have children. Uh, you, you can have all kinds of things. Oh, I have to accept that. I have to accept that with, with joy and patience. Offer it up. Sometimes it's indeed a penance. You offer it up. There are other things. There are other benefits, you know. Being a parent, sure, you have trials, tribulations, suffering. But there's a good side of it, too. So everything has the, its asset and liability side. Secondly, those members of the church who are stricken by infirmities, illnesses, poverty, or misfortunes, or who are persecuted for the sake of justice. Uh, they are invited to unite their, sorrow, their sorrows to the suffering of Christ in such a way that they not only satisfy more thoroughly the precept of penitence, but also obtain for other people, obtain for other people a life of grace and for themselves that beatitude which is promised in the gospel. And so if you're sick, uh, if you're poor, you suffer misfortune, unite that to Jesus. Offer it up, like Grandma used to say. Offer it up. Unite it to Jesus, however hard that is. Offer it up, and you'll bring down grace on yourself, your family, and indeed on the whole world. And third... The precept of penitence must be satisfied in a more perfect way by priests who are more closely linked to Christ through sacred character, as well as by those who follow the evangelical counsels, religious and vows. Um, that's been forgotten, too, by, by, by priests. You know, we, we, like most of the rest of the church, uh, have forgotten how important, how essential doing penance is, uh, how essential offering sacrifice is. Um, this is what atones for sin, not just our own, but other people. You know, an awful lot of people are spiritual invalids. They just don't have the spiritual strength to get up out of the moral pit that they're in. And so those on the outside have to do penance for them. We have to do penance for them. We have to offer up our sacrifices to the Lord to bring down the grace of conversion. People are always asking, well, how can I convert my son? How can I convert my husband? How can I? It isn't through words. Good example, but most of all, prayer and penance united to that prayer. Offer up your arthritis pain. Offer up your headaches. Offer up all those things, little and big, as a penance to God. That will infuse your prayer with power. In the final analysis, what this really is, is love. Authentic love, Christian love, 
uh, which is um, demonstrated by that Greek word agape. You know, there are several uh, words that are translated into the one word love from Koine Greek in the New Testament. But the, the highest form of love, agape love, Christian love, that is self-sacrificing love. That love which thinks so much of the other that it offers itself in sacrifice for the good of the beloved. In other words, if you love someone, if we love each other, we will offer sacrifice. We will offer ourselves in Jesus, through Jesus, with Jesus, as a sacrifice pleasing to the Father to bring down grace on all those people we love. And one day the result of that is we'll be happy in heaven for all eternity. God bless you, God love you, and goodbye. Greetings and God's blessings. This is Father John Corapi with another episode of Weekly Wisdom. Uh, this week I'm going to talk about uh, something that fits right in to uh, Lent since we're filming this during Lent. I'm going to talk about the sign of the cross. Uh, this is one of the most common sacramentals in the Catholic Church. Uh, we do it uh, pretty much... Um, subconsciously by now we've been doing it most of us since we were little kids and you know the sign of the cross is simply where you you uh, take your in the Latin rite in the Western Church <clears throat> take your right hand and uh, you go in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit Amen uh, in the Eastern churches the Byzantine Church and the other Eastern rites it's a they have a little more symbolism involved. Uh, it's a little bit more intricate. Uh, they take the uh, three fingers of the right hand uh, and then the, the two fingers and they make the, the three fingers remind you of the Trinity. Okay, symbolism is very important. That those three fingers remind you of the Trinity that you bless yourself with and the other two fingers uh, represent the two natures of Christ, uh, both divine and human. Uh, in general practice, uh, in the Roman Rite, uh, we're not quite so uh, 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 intense with the symbolism, but it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Uh, you know, as Pope John Paul II said, the church has to learn uh, how to breathe with both lungs. Uh, one lung is the Western Church, and the other is the Eastern. And the Eastern Rite churches are very important. And they bring us a rich tradition, uh, and, and uh, it, it would be very good for us um, to learn more about the, the Eastern rites, the Byzantine rite, Maronite rite, and so forth. But the sign of the cross, it, it's just so simple, so common for us, it, it's just second nature to us to make that sign of the cross. But what does it mean? Why do we do it? Uh, I'll tell you the reason, one of the reasons I'm, I'm doing this segment on the sign of the cross. A friend of mine uh, mentioned that um, <clears throat> a relative of his was going to a certain private school, and uh, she there encountered a, a kind of, um, oh, a religious um, uh, perspective that dis disturbed her. Uh, and they were saying, oh, Catholics, when they make the sign of the cross, they're... Uh, they're idolaters, and they're crucifying Christ again. Um, that's really, you know, I respect everybody's religion. I really do. And I perfectly respect their right to practice any religion they like. I really do. Uh, but their religion is one religion. Ours is another. And that's, the, you know, you don't have to get in arguments. Oh, well, you belong to a different religion. That's fine. You can believe anything you want. But in my religion, we believe this. I'm going to, in a very short period of time, try to give you a little f synthesis of why we believe what we do about the sign of the cross. Now, first and foremost, it's the sign of our salvation. The cross 
is the sign of our salvation. You know, when the eternal word, the second person of the blessed trinity, Jesus, when the eternal word became flesh and dwelt among us, why did he do that? Now, that's a question theologians have asked uh, and debated uh, throughout the ages. You know, all kinds of hypotheses can be posited. All kinds of ideas can be thrown around. But the bottom line is, uh, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus took, assumed a human nature and became like one of us in everything except sin for one reason. Redemption. Salvation. Oh, you can speculate about all kinds of things, but the bottom line is redemption. He assumed that human nature ultimately to take it to the cross. Uh, the passion, death, and resurrection of Christ is the way we enter into heaven. That's the way we can be stand before the Father. It's the only way our sins could have been Forgiven, oh, God could have done it any number of ways, but he chose to do it that way. So, when we make the sign of the cross, we are professing our faith in two essential things. Number one, the, the fundamental belief uh, of the Catholic Church, the Trinity. God is one God. There's only one God. And that one God is three divine persons. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, we can say certain things about that, but that's a mystery. You can say, well, how can it be? He's one and three. That's a contradiction. No, it's not. That's not a contradiction. That's a paradox. And if you want to do some, uh, some study and research, then you, you research the difference between a, 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 um, a, a, an opposition or a contradiction. That's one thing, a contradiction. And, and on the other hand, you've got a paradox. That's something different. Is God one God? Yes, there's only one God. Is that one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Absolutely. That's what we believe. That's part of the doctrine of the faith, and that's the most fundamental of our beliefs. So when we make the sign of the cross, we are professing our belief in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are signing ourselves with the Most Holy Trinity. And what else? Well, it's in the sign of the cross. That's what it's called, sign of the cross. We're crossing ourselves. We're making that, that, that symbolic gesture in the form of a cross. And the cross is the sign of our salvation. Why is this important, and why do people misunderstand it? Well, it's important because we're expressing two of our most fundamental, most essential beliefs in the Catholic Church. We are not angels, as you know. We are not disembodied spirits. We have not only a spiritual dimension, uh, a psychological dimension, we also have a bodily or corporeal dimension. We have a body, you know, sense perceptible. Sense perceptible signs are necessary for human beings, okay? Uh, maybe they wouldn't be if we were merely angels, but because we have a body and because sense perceptible things are so important, we use signs and symbols. Why? To help to raise us to God. Uh, the body, uh, unlike what certain heretics thought, Throughout history, the body is not evil. It's God's creation. So it's good, and it's holy. And, and so bodily signs, sense-perceptible signs, like the sign of the cross, or pictures, holy picture, the crucifix, statues of Jesus, the Blessed Mother, the saints, that helps us. They're sense-perceptible, right? You can see them. You can touch them. Those sense-perceptible images or signs help to raise our heart and mind to the God who cannot be seen, the God who is pure spirit. And so uh, they're necessary. Now, unfortunately, there have been from, oh, the, almost the, the very beginning, or, or uh, at least uh, after several centuries of Christianity, there were people who misunderstood this. 
Most people more or less have goodwill, I think. But quite frequently, they misunderstand things. Now, on the other hand, some people don't have goodwill, and they're just flat malicious. But, you know, uh, I give people the benefit of the doubt, and they say, well, look, they just don't understand what we believe. More than once, I've had uh, discussions with persons who say things uh, based on misunderstanding. Uh, and I, I don't hold that against them. You know, they may have been told that, brought up that way. It was a cultural thing. Oh, you Catholics worship images. No, we don't. Yes, you do. No, we don't. Yes, you do. No, we don't. And then, you know, the final uh, uh, um, retort to that is, I have a doctrine in Catholic theology that I earned the hard way by sitting in university classrooms for 12 years. I know what we believe. You get a doctorate in Catholic theology? What do you know about it? Nothing. You don't know anything about it. You're saying things that are born of misunderstanding or ignorance. Now, we worship God alone. Okay? That's one of the first tenets of the Catholic faith. We worship God alone. Who's that God? That's one God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Well, yeah, but, but you, you worship images, statues, pictures. No, we don't. No, we do not. We respect them. Why would we have a statue of Jesus representing, say, the Sacred Heart of Jesus? Or a statue of the Blessed Virgin Mary? Or a picture of St. Francis? You know, or, or the Archangel Michael or Gabriel? Why, why would we do that? It reminds us of the ones we love. We don't worship that image of wood or stone, that picture. No, that's like saying, because you carry a picture of your mom in your wallet, you're an idolater. No, you're not. You carry the picture of your mom. You don't worship that picture. You love your mom. You like to look at the picture and be reminded of your mom. We need sense-perceptible signs to help us. Why? We have a body. We can see, we can hear, we can touch. We require that as human beings. So, un unfortunately, people misunderstand this. You know, they, they, they just say, oh, you worship. We don't worship that. We worship God alone, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The pictures, you know, the, the, the cross, the, the crucifix, and the sign of the cross, okay, that's a symbol, a sign that helps to raise our heart and mind to God. It reminds us of the most holy trinity, the most fundamental tenet of our belief in the Catholic Church, and it reminds us of the mystery of redemption, which is symbolized by the cross. All right, now this is nothing new, as I said. Now, you know, I'm always interested in your education. You know, that's why I've done what I do uh, for over 20 years now. Uh, I want you to learn your faith. Uh, but in a little half-hour segment like this, obviously, I can't say everything there is to say about any topic. We try to uh, synthesize and condense, distill it, and present you the essence of a certain subject. And uh, we can do that. But uh, I want to encourage you to study on your own. That's why I've always encouraged you to read the Bible, uh, to read the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which will help you to understand sacred scripture. I'm going to give you a, a reading assignment if you're interested in this topic. You know, this goes back, you, if you want to have insight into this, um, this argument, if you will, um, look up iconoclasm, or the iconoclast heresy. This is nothing new. Uh, there's a great article in the Catholic Encyclopedia. You can just go on the internet, and if you're watching me, obviously uh, you have uh, access to the internet, and uh, just do a Google search or Yahoo, whatever search engine you use, uh, and, and put in uh, iconoclasm or iconoclast heresy. Probably one of the first um, references that come up uh, will be from the Catholic Encyclopedia. Uh, it's a 10-page article. I printed it out, and uh, I used 
I read it. Uh, it's nothing new. I've read it and studied it before. But most of this is really wrapped up in that heresy, which is iconoclasm, a misunderstanding, and sometimes a misunderstanding which, which uh, progressed into a violent hatred. And quite often, that's what happens when you misunderstand somebody else. And you don't want to do that. You want to try to be honest. You want to try to seek the truth, honestly. And the fact of the matter is, the Catholic Church doesn't worship idols. We use sense-perceptible signs to help us in our faith. It helps to raise your heart and your mind to God alone. And that's who we worship. And nothing else and no, nobody else. You, you know, there are people who say, Oh, every time Catholics make the sign of the cross, they re-crucify Christ. Look, that's what comes under the theological classification of happy horse manure. Got it? That's what that is. That's baloney. Absolute baloney. They don't know anything about our religion, and I don't purport to know anything about theirs. I respect theirs, respect ours. When we make the sign of the cross, we are simply making a statement of faith. I believe in the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and I believe in the sign of the cross, because it's the sign of our salvation. That's very simple. So this is nothing new. Most of it comes from the iconoclast heresy. Nothing new. Uh, by the way, a lot of the origins of that, not all of the origins, but a lot of the origins of that are Muslim. The Muslims have a absolute hatred for any symbolism they despise the human body. At least they did back in the, in the early centuries, uh, first ten centuries when we had clashes uh, with the Muslim empires. And, um, you know, that, that's where a lot of that came from. They wanted to destroy monasteries because they contained icons or, or, or crucifixes. They hated that. And it, that. That's based on misunderstanding. Well, it's worse than misunderstanding. When misunderstanding flows over it and becomes persecution and outright unmitigated hatred such that you're, you're cutting people's heads off and burning down monasteries and trying to destroy the relics of the church, that's where a lot of this comes from. Uh, it doesn't have its roots necessarily in Christianity, although there have been elements inside the church uh, that have gone wrong. There have always been been heresies, you know. Um, you know what a heresy is? I'm going to remind you. Most people, you know the word, but a heresy is a post-baptismal denial of some element of faith or morals that must be accepted with divine and Catholic faith or an obstinate doubt concerning same. Okay? Th this business of saying, oh, you worship a picture. No, we don't. No, we don't. Oh, well, what, what do you believe? And then you tell them, and, and you should know your faith. Listen, a lot of the reason for the difficulties and oh, outright horrible problems we have is because Catholics don't know their faith. You do not know how to argue these things. And you don't have to argue it, but just state it simply. Don't get an argument. Say, no, 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 no. We don't worship, you know, but most of all, you know, most of the time, Catholics are just speechless because they have no response. Well, it's not all your fault. Uh, you haven't been taught, right? You know, you haven't been taught these things in many cases. Some of you have who've taken the initiative to study your faith. But uh, it's very important that we become educated in our faith because a great host of evils flow from lack of proper education in the faith. Because they, you don't know. You hear some, oh, well, we must be terrible if we believe that. No, well, in the first place, we don't believe that. You know, a lot of mis misunderstanding. Okay, so you understand what, what it is, what we're doing. We're making a sign, a symbol. When we make the sign of the cross, we're blessing ourselves. We're signing ourselves with the sign of the Most Holy Trinity, 
and the cross. That's the sign of our salvation. Um, what does that do? That, that's a sacramental. Um, we are invoking innocence. We're invoking the power of God. Who's God? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We are invoking the power of God. We are asking for the protection of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We are asking for the protection and the grace and the power of the cross of Christ. When we cross ourselves, when the priest blesses people, what does he do? He makes the sign of the cross. May Almighty God bless you. I'm not blessing you. I don't have any power except that which God has given me. I, and, and so the blessing is, I bless you in the name of the Father. I don't bless you in my name. I'm blessing you in God's name. May God bless you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'm invoking the power of the Trinity and the power of redemption, and it's powerful. It is efficacious. The sign of the cross is a powerful weapon. You know, in the lexicon of uh, spiritual theology, uh, the sign of the cross is a sacramental. It is a weapon. Now, a soldier doesn't want to go out into battle unless he's well-armed. Right? It would be foolhardy. sign of the cross is one of those weapons that you can take against the enemy, and it's powerful. It's a powerful weapon against Satan and the fallen angels. Now, by the way, that's a doctrine of our faith. If you profess to be Catholic, but you don't believe in the existence and the activity of Satan and the fallen angels, then you are a heretic in plain English. Now, I know we are too polite today. We are too pseudo-sophisticated, too pseudo-educated to use the H word. But I will use it because it is necessary at times. It's not my favorite subject, but I've got to talk about it sometimes because, quite honestly, it is rampant in many places. So, the existence and the activity of the devil and the fallen angels, that's a doctrine of the faith. That's not optional teaching. You either believe it or you don't. If you don't, then you're a heretic. You have to believe what the church believes. And I'll tell you something. You know, there are all kind of pseudo-sophisticated, pseudo-educated people, even inside the Catholic Church, in teaching positions, who will say they don't believe in that. Well, you, you, see, you know where they are. I can go out in the street to any number of drug addicts, alcoholics, motorcycle gang members, and, and, and criminals, and ask them if they believe in the devil, and invariably they say, absolutely, they're well acquainted with him, and they believe and very often, by the way, it's that belief in the power of evil that you can use to help elevate them to belief in God. But if somebody doesn't believe in the power of evil, very frequently they're just a hair away from believing in nothing. And so, the sign of the cross is a powerful weapon against evil, against the devil. Great saints throughout the history of the church have professed that, ha have written about that. Their lives give witness to that. St. Anthony of the Desert, one of the great uh, early uh, hermits and monks of the church, um, he frequently used the sign of the cross to drive away the devil. He, he would be attacked even physically. Oh, don't worry, you're not going to get attacked physically. Uh, you're most likely not that evil or not that holy. And that's who gets attacked directly. I'm talking physically. You get attacked, though. You get attacked through temptation. You're going to be attacked emotionally. You're going to suffer terrible oppression. The effects of the combat of the enemy. Um, absolutely. Almost every human being suffers that at one time or another. But St. Anthony found that the sign of the cross... Now, listen, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a spiritual tip here. This is that you could include this into the, into the spiritual directions kind of corner. Uh, it, when you're assaulted by temptation, it could be temptation against chastity. It could be a temptation of anger and hatred. One of the most powerful things you can do is just compose yourself for a second and, and just sign yourself. Make the sign of the cross. 
In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You know, that, that, that's like putting armor on. I'm not saying that all your problems will instantly go away, but that you will be using a weapon. And if you use it with great faith, you know, being a sacramental, the power of it is, is proportional to your subjective belief. In other words, you have to believe. Uh, you can't just do it as, as perfunctory and routine. You've got to believe in it, and it's powerful. I've got plenty of experience with it, and I'll tell you something. It really is powerful against the enemy. When we make that sign of the cross, we are uniting ourselves with Jesus and Jesus crucified. You know, Jesus was many things. Jesus is many things. He's a, he's a teacher. You know, they called him rabbi, and rightly so. Uh, he's a ruler. He's a king, right? They right, put right up on the cross, you know, the king of the Jews. Pilate called him king of the Jews. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, king of the universe. So Jesus certainly, uh, he's a prophet too, the consummation of all prophecy. So he's all those things, but more than anything, he's a savior. And how did he save us? Through the cross, the power of the cross. And so when you make the sign of the cross, uh, when we bless things, uh, when we bless people, you know, parents, you can bless your children, you know. Oh, yeah. You, you can make the sign of the cross on their forehead. Oh, God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. My grandmother used to do that to us kids before we'd go out quite frequently. That's an old custom. And it's not an empty custom. It's powerful. And you should do it. Use the sign of the cross. You know, don't be afraid to make the sign of the cross. Do it. We're uniting ourselves with Jesus and him crucified. You know, and then, oh, well, that, that's, uh, we're resurrection people. Yeah, how'd you get that way? You got that way through the crucifixion. There is no resurrection without the crucifixion. There is no Easter Sunday without the pain, darkness, and suffering of Good Friday. Good Friday always comes first on my liturgical calendar. So you're not going to have the resurrection without the crucifixion. They go together. You can't separate them. They are a strict unity. One mystery, the Paschal mystery. What's that? The passion, death, and resurrection of Christ and his ascension into glory. So when we make the sign of the cross, we're professing all that in, in, a, in a very concise, synthesized, distilled kind of a way. You don't have to think of all those things, but you're making a statement in the universe. You're making a statement to all of creation. I believe in the Father and in the Son and in the Holy Spirit. I believe in Jesus and him crucified. I believe in the power of the cross. That's what we do when we make the sign of the cross. That is our faith. If some other people in some other religion don't want to believe that or accept it, fine. That's their business. They belong to a different religion. But this is our religion. Oh, I could tell you a lot of stories about the cross and the sign of the cross um, throughout my vocational journey, throughout my ministry. Uh, as a priest, I've encountered uh, um, many difficult situations. I've encountered people uh, struggling and suffering from many different things. I, I, I've been called to so-called haunted houses. You know, places, oh, ghosts live here. <clears throat> well, in the first place, there's no ghost, okay? There's no ghost, but there are spiritual realities, okay? Uh, invariably, if there is a basis in fact, to what they're saying. Let's say a place is haunted. A place has problems. What they have is problems with the demonic. And I'm not sure how they got there. They could have gone there through, through uh, some kind of occult practices taking place there, some kind of terrible sin taking place there. Uh, there are all kinds of ways that a place can get infected by the power of evil. But one of the most powerful remedies is quite simply the sign of the cross. 
Now, I've talked to countless hundreds and thousands of people who have experienced the assaults of the enemy. Listen, this is not rocket science. One of the most powerful things you can do, you may be home alone one night. You may suddenly feel very fearful for no apparent reason. You may suddenly feel that evil surrounds you. Make the sign of the cross. Powerful. I remember one time in the course of my ministry many years ago, there was a woman who uh, uh, came to me in the days when I, I had time and was able to minister in that fashion. Uh, she said, I think I have problems with the devil. Now, you, you don't always, you hear that a lot. But quite often it can be just, can be their imagination. Uh, they could have an emotional problem. But I do not discount it. Here's a good rule. Neither be cynical nor credulous. Uh, preternatural reality is reality in, in, in indeed. The existence and activity of the angels and the fallen angels, that's part of reality. Anyway, I, I met with her uh, in the residence of a certain chaplain in a certain religious place, and um, she began to say, oh, yeah, she was, a, by the way, a practicing Catholic, going to Mass, receiving the sacrament. During the course of that, it, it was amazing, something right out of a movie. Um, an, an unnatural light came up into her eyes. The room got icy cold, and it was like electricity charged the air. And she looked at me with an evil grin. Do you feel that? She said. And she started to take her clothes off. And I said, in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And she fell over, flat on the ground, and began to convulse violently. Long and the short of the story, the difficulties she'd had for years, what she'd been plagued with for years, and all kinds of symptoms of the demonic, left her and never returned. That is the power of the cross. That's the sign of the cross, my friends. So use it and be confident in it, because that is our faith. God love you, God bless you, and goodbye. Greetings and God's blessing. This is Father John Karapi with another episode of Weekly Wisdom. This week I'm going to talk to you uh, about the essence of our faith. Now this is a very, very simple presentation. Uh, and what I'm going to attempt to do is just summarize, synthesize, and distill the very substance, the essence of our Catholic faith. Now, you might think, well, why do that? You know, they, everybody knows it, don't they? Uh, incredibly, no. They don't know it. Um, if people really knew their faith, if, if our people knew what they had, they'd practice it. But in North America, something like 75, 80%, even in some places, of Catholic folks don't even go to church. They don't even show up for Mass on Sundays and holy days of obligation. Now, I'm not talking about uh, people who are sick or elderly people, shut-ins. No, no. You know, that's not a sin. They can't help that. I'm talking about perfectly healthy people who have no good excuse. They just don't go. They just don't practice their faith. Uh, and they don't know. They don't know what their religion is about. They don't know the essence of their They think they do, but they really don't. Uh, there are all kinds of people who call themselves Catholic or Christian, but in fact, they're really not. How do you know if you are? If you believe what the church believes, 
in faith and morals, and then you practice what the church professes, then in fact, you're Catholic. Uh, but, but if you don't, then that's very questionable that you are. Pope John Paul II, and actually every recent pope, uh, said to the effect, there is a very large gap between what we profess and what we live. We have to narrow the gap. And that's a fact. So, uh, what is the substance, the essence of our Catholic faith? Now, someone could say, love. And they would be right. Unfortunately, a large percentage of the people who would say that don't know what love is. That, that's like my, by, by now, well-circulated story of the kind of thing I do when I talk to people about to get married. You know, a lot of young people. And sometimes not so young either. They can be quite <clears throat> advanced in age. You know, they're going to get married. And, uh, you know, love, yes, we're in love. Of course, we're in love, L-U-V. Right. And so I'll ask them, well, what's love? <clears throat> you know, what's love? Uh, oh, you know, we got feelings for each other. Baloney. If all you got is feelings for each other, you know, feelings can be up one day, down one day, over here one day. You know, if all you got is feelings, you're like a yo-yo. And frequently the devil's pulling the string. So you better have more than feelings if you're supposed to be in love. Uh, well, okay, um, um, fine. Then if you're really in love, what does it mean? Well, what it really means is to desire the highest and best thing for the sake of the one you love. If you love your husband, wives, or husbands, if you love your wife, or mom and dad, if you love your children, or children, if you love your parents, what do you desire for them? Happiness, good. But what is that? What is that? Uh, the, the, what it really is, is the word in theology we use called beatitude. That's, that's authentic happiness. And, and what is that? That means being in the immediate presence of God. Another word for that is called heaven or eternal salvation. If you love someone, you must desire with your whole heart, mind, and strength that they be in heaven with God for all eternity. And if, and if that's not the kind of love you have, you have some other kind of lower imposter to the throne. It's not authentic love. It's not Christian love. There, there are a lot of, of misunderstandings about love. We have had thousands of inane, ineffective and boring sermons for many years on love. We must love and we must... Uh, right, we must love. But what on earth is it? Well, first place, you've got to start from the beginning. If you want to really tell the story, you've got to start from the beginning. Go back to the book of Genesis. That's the first book of the Bible. Go back to the first chapter of Genesis, and the second. What does that have to do with? Creation. In the beginning, God created the universe. <clears throat> now, from all eternity, God is. Okay? Uh, there was never a time when God didn't exist. God is. That's why he told Moses, I am who am. That means his very essence is to exist. So you've you got to go way back in order to get a proper understanding of this. So from all eternity, God is one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, and then, at some point, God called things into being. Uh, creation, only God can create. Now, we use that term in an accommodated sense, like an artist creates something, a painting, a piece of music, and so forth. Uh, that's an accommodated sense of the term. That's not real creation. Uh, what we're talking about is, is real creation. Uh, to create something is to bring it into being out of nothing. Only God can bring things into being 
out of nothing. Uh, creation, we are contingent being. Yes, with the help of God and the gifts he's given us, uh, we can uh, do great things. We can uh, uh, make scientific findings, paint a beautiful picture, sing a beautiful song, uh, compose uh, an opera, whatever. Uh, yes, <clears throat> we can do that because we're created in the image and likeness of God. But without the power of God behind it, uh, nothing happens. And so uh, any, quote, creation that creatures are engaged in, that, that's a different thing. That's not actual, real creation, properly speaking. So God brings everything into being out of nothing. That's Genesis 1 and 2. He proclaimed it all to be good, right? Everything God created... Uh, good. Somebody always say, what about the devil? He's not good. No, but there was no devil in the beginning. In the beginning, God created and everything he created is good, including the angels. But then the third chapter of, of Genesis. Now, at some place in there, the angels were given a test. Some of them failed. They refused to accept God's plan. They refused to accept God's love. They were arrogant. That arrogance issued in disobedience, which issued in moral and spiritual death. They fell from heaven. They fell from grace. Jesus said, I watched Satan and his angels fall from heaven like lightning. That was after they were created. They made a decision that wasn't in accord with God's will. They acted in a fashion that was not in accord with God's will, wisdom. But in the beginning, they were good, very good. Third chapter of Genesis speaks of the fall in the Garden of Eden. Our first parents are created. How were they created? Good. Very good. But then through the abuse of their intellect and free will, they made a choice. They made a decision that was motivated by pride. And, and by that word, I mean arrogance. That, that word described in Greek by hubris. Hubris, self-centered, egotistical arrogance. That's the kind of arrogance that exalts the creature above the creator. And so God gave Adam and Eve, and by the way, some say, oh, that's not a real story. That's just a, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You know, who are you to say Adam and Eve weren't real? Like one Jewish friend of mine would say, so you were there? <laughs> you know, in the beginning, hey, who cares? You know, it's, it, it, for our purposes, it's real. It doesn't matter if there was an actual Adam and an actual Eve, our first parents. There probably was, as far as I'm concerned. All the saints thought so. And, you know, so some upstart theologian or scientist now gratuitously posits that there's no real Adam and Eve. So you were there? How do you know? And so, it doesn't matter, though. Why? Because the story itself, the recounting of this, is what matters. A first set of parents in a test. They failed. You know, the, the serpent comes along and tricked them. Oh, did God tell you you can't eat of the fruits of the trees in the garden? No, no, Eve said. God said we can partake of all the fruits in the garden. Remember this. Human freedom is very broad. But, but, but. You may not partake of the tree in the center of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, or even touch it, lest you die. Human freedom has limits, and the limits are laid down by God. Humanity would do well to recall that. But the devil had a good story, plausible, sounded good. He, he was a good rhetorician, he could talk real convincingly, kind of like some politicians. You know, they talk and they talk and they talk. Oh, sounds good. He gets people all motivated and hyped up. But, you know, what's, in, what's inside the rhetoric? Nothing. It's like Jesus said, the, the, the Pharisees, referring to the Pharisees, they're whitewashed sepulchers. You know what a sepulcher is. That's a place where you put a dead person. Whitewashed sepulchers filled with dead men's bones. And so that's empty rhetoric. So, the devil, he was a good talker, though, and Eve bought it. 
She bought the lie. She looked at it. Oh, it looked good. You know, it looked like it was good to eat. And the devil convinced her. He said, look, God just doesn't want you to be like him, knowing good and evil. So, Eve bought the lie. She partook of the forbidden fruit, gave it to her husband. They both did. And what happened? Exactly what God said would happen. Now, the devil tried to call God a liar. Oh, no, God just doesn't want you to be like him. He knows you'll become like gods. If you partake of that fruit, you'll become like gods. And then you can decide what's good and evil subjectively and arbitrarily without reference to the commands and admonitions of God Almighty. And so, arrogance, I can be like God. The result, disobedience. They partook of the forbidden fruit. The ultimate result, death, moral death. And that is where pain, suffering, and death entered the created universe, right there at the beginning. And so it has been ever since. And it's the same today. That prototypical sin, now recall what it is. The prototypical sin, and that which is, which is at the heart of every sin, that, that arrogance that exalts the creature above the creator. Want an example of that? Sure, I can give you a lot of them. Somebody decides that they're going to play God by deciding when life will begin. That's called artificial contraception. And when life will end. That's called abortion or euthanasia or murder. No, no, only God can do that. You know, oh, but they have a right to choose. Choose what? The choice has been made. Life has been conceived. And now you want to play God by ending life. You see, that's all wrapped up in the primordial sin. Arrogance, disobedience, death. Ultimately, the second death, which the book of Revelation talks about, that's the loss of your soul forever. And so, the substance of our faith concerns all this. You have to set the stage that way. Uh, It concerns love. Indeed, the substance of Christianity is love. However, not any love. Now, let me tell you about one of the most common, prevalent errors um, in contemporary society. It's nothing new, but, but this is very, very important. It concerns language. Now, language, to understand it properly, language, whether it, whatever language it is, whether it's Latin, Greek, Hebrew, English, French, German, any language, language is like a beast of burden, like a donkey or a horse. Language has the, the function, the mission of conveying reality, Okay. Uh, the underlying reality is what's really important. Now, now, think about this. In the English language, we have one word for love. Love. Now, think about the enormous distance between various meanings and significations of the one term, love. I love hamburgers. I love my cat, Tinkle Bell. I love my friend, George. I love my lover, Susie Q. I love my wife. I love my husband. I love God. One word, God, to express a tremendous number of different realities. You don't love God the way you love hamburgers, or if you do, you're in trouble. There's a huge difference But we only have one word. Language, the English language, hence in that sense, is deficient. You know, it's like, what what do you do with a vehicle? You know, a a horse. You know, well, it's fun to ride horses, okay. But normally, in the old days anyway, take you from point A to point B. A car, you know, oh, it can be fun to drive a car. But it basically takes you from point A to point B, you know. Uh, Whatever you're riding, a camel, a donkey, A Ferrari takes you from point A to point B. In many respects, all language is a deficient conveyance 
Uh, they all have, all languages have a defect. English, in this sense, is hugely deficient. Now, in the original language of the New Testament, which is Koine Greek, um, you've got three, actually four, but I'll mention three um, words for love. Um, eros, that's romantic or sexual love. Now, that's a t- one reality. You've got philia, brotherly love. You know, that's a good, healthy love, a love for people. You know, I love my brother, I love my friend. You know, I love this, I love that. Philia, you know the word Philadelphia. You know, that's where it comes from. City of brotherly love, philia. And then you've got a, a, another word, agape. Now, that is the love that is associated with Christian love, agape love. That is the love best demonstrated when you look at a crucifix, you know. There's a crucifix behind me here. Uh, or if you have one, look at that crucifix. That, when you look at that, is the best physical representation of what we call agape love. That is the love of God our Father. God so loved us that he sent his only Son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish in their sins, but come to everlasting life. Now, what does that statement encompass? It encompasses what happened. Redemption, salvation. God so loved the world that he sacrificed his only son, Jesus Christ, who suffered and died on the cross. Why? Love. Love. So what's the essence of Christian love? It's this word, agape love. That's what it represents. And what what does that word represent? That word represents self-sacrificing, self-donating love. That love which counts the beloved and what happens to the beloved above all other things. That is what we have a crisis with today. My friends, talk is cheap. Talk's very cheap. Oh, I'm Christian. I'm Catholic. You know, love, 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 yeah? You're willing to be crucified for someone who hates your guts? If you're not, you don't really have the love of Jesus. You know, it, it's all through the scriptures. Jesus said it in the, in the gospel. You know, if you only uh, treat your friends well, if you only love those who love you, what merit is there in that? You know, but, but if you're... Now listen, <laughs> let me tell you a difference here. Make a sidebar here. Liking somebody and loving them are two different things. When we're talking about Christian love, agape love. You know, there are some people that, and we know this, this is just a common fact of life. There are some people that absolutely drive you nuts. I I know that I drive a lot of people crazy. Man, they can't stand me. I've heard it, you know, they hear the sound of my voice and they, they, oh, they can't stand it. It grates on their ears. They, they want to they wanna shoot the, the CD player or the DVD player. I've had people tell me that, wives or husbands. Well, I, just, I play your, thing, your stepfather in the house. Oh, my husband hates it. He, he has to run out. He leaves the house. I remember one story. Some people, the, the lady was a good Irish lady, and her husband was, uh, oh, a decent man. But he wasn't too church going, you know. And the lady, she was like, lo, she practiced her religion, daily communicant. And uh, she would play my, my tapes in the house, you know. And in the car, she'd want to put them in. They're going on a trip. Oh, it drove the poor guy nuts. And so they, decided, they went on vacation one year. And so they went over to Ireland to visit some of her relatives and to see the, the town that, that her ancestors had come from and so forth. They were just bringing the suitcases into the little cottage out in County Cork uh, where her relatives or cousins live. They put the suitcases down and all of a sudden a, 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 a voice came drifting in from a back room. And the man said, I, I know that voice. I know that voice. It was my voice. And the old grandmother was in the back room playing cassettes of my sermons. 
he couldn't get away. So yes, there are people you can't stand them. You know, there are people that drive me nuts too. That's human. That's the human condition. There are a lot of things and a lot of people even that we don't like. But you've got to love them. You have to love them. They might drive you nuts. What is love? Love, and listen to this. I'm getting right to the substance of it here. Love is a decision, not a feeling. Oh, this is very important. Love is a decision, an act of the will. It is not an emotion. It is not, oh, that can be a component, that can be a fuzzy side effect, but love is a decision. Love is not a feeling. Love is not an emotion. Love is an act of the will. You know, a certain person might drive you crazy. And you say, I just can't love them. I must be a horrible Christian. What you're really talking about is it's hard to like them. Listen, humanity admits of an enormous number of degrees. We're all different. We're all different. Some people are a delight to get along with. You can get along with them. It's not a problem. You love to be in their presence. No problem. But every once in a while, you'll meet somebody that drives you nuts. And you just say, I I just can't love them. Oh, yes, you can. Oh, you have to. You might not be able to like them, but you have to love them. And what's the difference? Love is a decision, an act of the will. You have to ultimately desire the highest and best thing for the sake of that person, and that's heaven. Okay? That's really what this is about. God loves us so much that he wants us to be in heaven with him forever. Now, frequently, we don't want to go. You know? God wants us there, but we don't. You say, well, I want to go to heaven. Well, then why are you committing all those sins? You know, it, it, you know it's, it's like the old saying that the Indians used to say, you know, white men speak with forked tongue. On one hand, we say, oh, I want to go to heaven. On the other hand, you're stabbing somebody in the back, you know, committing adultery, doing drugs, all kinds of things. But I want to go to heaven. <clears throat> you see, you've got to narrow the gap between what you profess and what you live. So love. It's, it's to desire, and not just to desire. Yes, I desire that you be in heaven forever. I, that's love. I've got to desire that. Everything else is baloney. You know, St. Paul said, it's all rubbish. It's all rubbish except the surpassing knowledge of my Lord Jesus Christ. It's all rubbish if you don't get to heaven. Nothing else matters but eternal salvation in the end. You know, your husband, your wife, you know, the guy that treated you horribly, the person that abused you, okay? You have to love them, and you have to desire their salvation. Otherwise, you can't call yourself Christian. Don't pray the Our Father ever again if you refuse to forgive. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. I know it's hard. I know it can be very, very difficult. But we have to do this. We have to. We're called to do it. Okay? And remember them. So, yes, I desire the highest and best thing for the sake of every human being. That's heaven. And that's not enough, though. Desiring it is not enough. If you desire it, what are you going to do about it? And that's where sacrifice comes in. You have to be willing to do penance, to offer sacrifice, and very often living virtuously can be a very big sacrifice. It's not easy to put your money where your mouth is, so to speak. So self-sacrifice, you know, we we have to do this. Um, Somebody that you know, a relative, a child, a parent, whatever, a friend, a co-worker, um, maybe they're living in sin, uh, and they like it, and they get angry and violent. If anybody tries to say, don't you know what you're doing? I hate to see you hurt yourself. But they they rebel. Uh, Pray. You know, I've received thousands of questions throughout the years. What can I do for my children? 
What can I do for my husband? What can I do for this guy and that woman? What can I do to help them get to heaven? In the end, pray. Pray and do penance. Sacrifice. Offer up all your little sacrifices and sufferings for the sake of the salvation of souls. You've got to cultivate this attitude of self-sacrifice. This has been terribly eviscerated from much of the church in recent years. It's been torn out of the heart of the church and discarded in the gutter as though it were unimportant. It's essential. It's authentic love. <clears throat> How do you do it, though? I'm going to give you a little, a little way, so to speak. I'm going to give you a little way to practice this sacrifice in a, in a very positive way, and it's easy. Uh, I'm going to point you towards one of the greatest saints in the history of the, of the church. Saint Therese of the Child Jesus and the Holy Face was her name in religion. Um, we know her commonly as Saint Therese of Lisieux. Uh, as she resided in France in the, in the, in the Carmelite Monastery over there. Um, St. Therese really never left the monastery once she went in. She was a contemplative nun. She went in, and she only lived to be 24 years old. Never left the walls of the monastery once she went in. She was enclosed with papal enclosure. But she affected the whole world. Uh, she was named patroness of the missions, <laughs> you know, well, she, you may say she wasn't a missionary. Oh, yes, she was. She never went to Borneo or Africa or any of those other mission countries, but she affected that. She, why? She offered her life in sacrifice for the missionaries to bring grace down on them and their ministry. That's love. She said she wanted to be love in the heart of the church after she died. You know, I'll shower, a shower of roses upon mankind. How's she going to do that? Well, she was close to God through her life of virtue, prayer, and sacrifice. So how do you do it? You practice what's called the little way. St. Therese was named a doctor of the church. And you know, there are only 33 of them in the entire history of the church. There are only 33 doctors of the church. St. Therese is the 33rd. Pope John Paul II elevated her to that noble title, Doctor of the Church. And the substance of it is this. Do little things with great love. St. Therese often said, I can't do great things, I can just do little things. I'm not capable of grand penances like the saints of old. All I can do is little things, like you're mopping the floor. You offer it to God. You know, you've got a cold or the flu or arthritis or... God forbid, cancer or something worse. You offer that up in a simple way, like my grandmother used to say. Offer it up. That, those three little words summarize the power of our religion. It's the substance of our faith. But that's love, self-sacrificing love. And it's all caught up, and then some in, in summit of it all is in the Eucharist. The very substance of our faith is the Holy Eucharist. The Eucharist is the source, the center, and the summit of the church's life. So the key to living the essence of our faith, be a Eucharistic person. You must enter into the Eucharist and make it presence. Live the Holy Eucharist. And, and what is the substance of the Eucharist? Certainly love, but it is the sacrifice of Jesus, the Son of God, a divine person, through his human nature, he willingly sacrificed himself for the salvation of souls, for the remission of sin, that our sins might be forgiven. So you enter into that. Uh, the nuns used to tell us in the old days, now children, when the priest elevates the chalice and the paten with Jesus on it, the host and the precious blood, you unite yourself, you put yourself through an act of love, you place yourself on the chalice, in the chalice and on the paten. You become one with Jesus. And then when the priest says, through him, with him, and in him, you are lifted up in Jesus as a living sacrifice for the salvation of souls. That is the essence of our faith. God love you, God bless you, and goodbye.
Greetings and God's blessings to you. This is Father John Karapi with another episode of Weekly Wisdom. This week I'm going to talk to you uh, about a, a topic that I've, uh, I've spoken about it a lot in the past. Uh, we continue to have a great many requests uh, for me to uh, talk on this topic. Um, and, that, and that's about the sacrament of reconciliation or penance. Quite frequently we'll do presentations during Lent on this subject matter, but Lent is not the only time that we should go to confession. Uh, it's necessary for the simple reason that, uh, that we're sinners, uh, and it helps us. Uh, remember, every sacrament gives you an increase of sanctifying grace, uh, so you should be well disposed to receive the sacrament uh, and do what the church instructs us to do, but by all means, try to go to confession regularly, um, once a month anyway, uh, whether you need it or not, because whether you believe it or not, you need it. Uh, we need the increase of sanctifying grace, which comes to us in this sacrament in a forgiving and healing way. Uh, it's very unique. Every sacrament's unique. Uh, we have seven of them, and uh, Jesus gave us seven because we need seven. So what I'm going to do is try to help you very briefly now. You know, you could teach university-level courses on the subject matter, but we don't have that kind of time. Just in uh, 20, 30 minutes, I'm going to just try to go through uh, with you uh, how, to, how to make a good confession, uh, the um, necessity of confession, and so forth. Um, if you want a, a little more in-depth presentation on this, um, our one-hour DVD and CD, How to Make a Good Confession, would be uh, a good place uh, to um, uh, look. Uh, it's just, we take about an hour and we go through everything, as I'm going to do now, but in a more synthesized manner, because I don't have as much time. When you go to confession, remember who it is that you're confessing to. God already know, knows our sins, that's for sure. Uh, it's for us. Uh, it's not for him. It's for us. He, he knows the state of our soul. Uh, it's important that we know it as well. A lot of people don't really know the state of their soul because they don't even take a moment to reflect on things. Um, that's one of the reasons why um, you have to have some silence and some prayer in your life. Uh, we live in a noisy world, and one thing that all that noise does is it distracts us chronically. Uh, a great number of people, a lot of young people and some not so young, aren't in touch with the state of their soul on a day-to-day -day basis. So, you know, you need to take a little bit of time every day to pray uh, in silence, a little bit of silence. If you have to get up early in the morning to do that, then by all means do it. Make an examination of conscience. Now, that, that's really where, where we need to begin. We begin, really, with humility, the acknowledgement of the truth. We acknowledge the truth, that, that God is all-loving, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-seeing, and all-merciful. We are sinners. Uh, it is necessary for us to repent of our sins. Now, God's mercy is there for everybody, no matter how bad the sinner no matter how bad the sin, God's mercy uh, is bigger than all the sin in the world. So if your sins be as scarlet, as Scripture says, they can be made whiter than snow, washed by the blood of the Lamb. And so uh, how do you approach this? Well, number one, with humility. You approach the sacrament with humility. You can't please God if you are an arrogant person. An arrogant person doesn't believe they're a sinner. I've actually had people uh, tell me that. I don't commit sin. Uh, people 70, 80 years old. I, I haven't committed any sins in my life. Um, that's just not true. As Bishop Sheen used to remark, I think the Blessed Mother 
was the only one immaculately conceived. We are sinners, and as such, we have a, a need, a great compelling need, to go before God humbly and honestly. Uh, we have the great sacrament of reconciliation or penance in the Catholic Church, the sacrament of confession. Uh, that's a great blessing for God. Uh, some people will say, oh, I don't have to tell my sins to a man. Well, you're not. You're telling them to God. And in the person of the priest, see, who said that it should be that way? God did. You don't believe it? Check out the 16th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew and the way it's been interpreted from the early days of the church by the fathers, the doctors, and saints of the church. We go to confession. All right, we have a humble attitude. Uh, we go before God as, as penitents and supplicants, not as commandants. Uh, we acknowledge we are sinners. How do you do it? Well, you make a good examine of, examination of conscience, of course. Go through the commandments. Now, let me tell you something I found out long ago. In the very early days of my ministry, actually before I ever began ministering as a deacon and then a priest, um, I knew intuitively that large numbers of the Catholic faithful just don't know their faith. Um, somewhere along the line, we dropped the ball, things slipped through the crack, and we have generations of Catholics who don't even know the Ten Commandments. Do you? Do you? What's the Eighth Commandment? Hmm? I'll wait. What's the Third Commandment? No, that's the Fifth. What's the Third? Do you know the commandments? Y yes, yes, Gertrude. You have to know them in order. One, two, three, four, five, and so forth. You know, the First Commandment isn't the Eighth Commandment. You've got to know the Ten Commandments in order. That's a little bit of memorization. We used to memorize things. Uh, we, we got away from it. That was a mistake. There's a lot more to memorization, of course, in our faith. But you've got to have some basic knowledge, a structure. So you've got to know the Ten Commandments. If you don't know the Ten Commandments by heart, and you can rattle them off one after the other and know what they mean, then you've got to get busy. I'm just going to give you a little... A little uh, start here, a little nudge in the right direction, then you've got to uh, take the ball and run with it. You've got to do a little study on your own, Look, uh, consult with the Catechism of the Catholic Church, look it up, and, and study this. But I'm going to go through the commandments to help you make a good examination of conscience so you can make a good confession. And I'm going to promise you something. Uh, if you will do so, now it's, maybe it's only been a month since your last confession. Uh, maybe it's been 30 or 40 years. Whatever the case may be, you will be happy when you go to confession. Oh, I know. It can be a little bit intimidating. Oh, I don't like to do it. What's he going to think of me? Let me tell you something. The priest is not going to think anything bad about you. He's heard it all. All priests have heard it. All. Don't think your sins are worse than everybody else's. Uh, believe me, your sins are just as mundane, just as bad or not so bad as everybody else. So don't worry. Remember that in the person of Christ, the priest ministers, who are you confessing your sins to? Jesus. How are you doing that? by confessing in the context of confession, the sacrament, to the ministerial priest who stands in the person of Jesus Christ. It's so important. Listen, the state of the world, state of our country, even the state of the church to a certain extent, uh, is very much dependent upon the state of the soul of individual human persons. Um, you know, as the individuals go, so goes everything. So we have to have the attitude, look, if we're going to change our parish, we're going to change our, our, our city, our state, our country, the world, the church, it happens one person at a time. I can only effect positive change on what's out there by effecting positive change on what's in here. And that's what confession is all about. So let's just go quickly through the Ten Commandments 
and an examination of conscience. You should do this every time you go to confession. You should make a good examination of conscience every day as a spiritual exercise. And then, of course, right before you go to confession, you should do that. All right. First commandment. And let me just tell you, I'm going to break them down the, the way, actually, the way they're given. Uh, the first three commandments concern our relationship with God himself directly. Uh, the fourth through the tenth concern our relationship with each other, right? The rest of humanity. So, the vertical dimension, our relationship with God, commandments one through three. And then the horizontal dimension, our relationship with each other. Okay, so you have to have, what do you have when you've got the vertical, our relationship with God, and the horizontal, our relationship with each other, a cross, a cross. Yes, it, it can be a cross to live in our broken human condition. Um, we need strength to carry the cross. It, it can be a cross putting up with other people. Uh, I have a friend who says there's only one problem in all the world people. <laughs> and that's probably true, and you need to have God's grace uh, to deal uh, with people. We, we have to put up with, you, with each other, love each other even. It's, it's a mandate. So, we make a good confession. First, I am the Lord your God. You shall not have strange gods before me. And then, you shall not make uh, Graven image. It, it concerns idolatry. The first commandment, listen, if we obeyed the first commandment perfectly, uh, the, we wouldn't really need the other nine because everything would fall into place. If you put God first in everything, if you erected no false gods. Now, in antiquity, there, there was more, I think, idolatrous religions. Um, it still exists today. Um, animism, where they worship trees, they consider there's a god in the tree, or, or different created objects. Um, but in general, the way that we have false gods today is by putting something before God. Well, I don't do that, no. Well, how about money? How about your job? How about um, things like drugs? alcohol, sex, um, put God first in everything. Everything else is subordinate. And if you put God first, you'll obey his commandments. Um, people say, oh, I'm a good Christian. Uh, I, I love God. And then they break the commandments chronically. On a regular basis, think nothing of it. Don't repent. There are Christians and Catholics who do this. On a regular basis. Then they refuse to acknowledge that it's, a, that it's a sin. Oh, that's not a sin. Who said so? It's been a sin for centuries. Now all of a sudden, you're making it something less than a sin? Look, for those of you who got confused a few decades ago, the Second Vatican Council did not change the Ten Commandments to the Ten Suggestions. They're still the Ten Commandments. And they bind always and everywhere, and no one has the power to dispense from them. Put God first. Don't erect created things as idols. You know, listen, you need some money, you've got to work, you've got to provide for your family. That's true. Not a problem. Make sure that you put God first in all things, and, and then everything else will fall into place. Second, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. You remember in the Old Testament, the great reverence the chosen people had for God's holy name. No one could even utter Yahweh, the name of, of the Lord, except the high priest in the Holy of Holies once a year. Great reverence for the name of God. And now, so many people use it as a curse word, the holy name of Jesus uh, or God, uh, they use it to curse with. This is not, it's not good. <laughs> it's bad for the state of your soul. It's bad for you psychologically, and it creates pollution. Verbal pollution, spiritual pollution, moral pollution. Don't 
do it. Now, it can be a habit, and like any habit, it can be hard to break. Break it. Whatever it takes, do not use God's holy name to curse with. Uh, that, that's the second commandment, and it's, and it's essential. Uh, no Catholic or Christian, no, no person at all, should use God's name in a base or, or, or a, um, uh, a way that is less than, than holy. Have reverence for God's name. Third commandment, remember to keep holy Lord's Day. Well, uh, for us, uh, that would be Sunday for Christians and Catholics. And in keeping with the ancient tradition, Sunday begins with the vigil of Sunday, which is Saturday evening. We usually say at sunset the day before. That's when the liturgical calendar begins. So when does Sunday begin? Saturday evening. Uh, maybe 4 or 5 o'clock in the evening, 6 o'clock. But uh, that's why we have vigil masses now. Is that a Saturday mass? No. A vigil mass is a Sunday mass. Uh, why? Because the vigil begins the evening before the day we're talking about. So on, on, on Sundays, in holy days of obligation, feasts, solemnities, and so forth. You must go to mass. You know, we became very, very lax over the years. A lot of things uh, we became lax in. But this one... Um, Listen, you must go to Mass if you're a Catholic. Now, I'm talking to Catholics here. Uh, other Christians go to church on Sunday, too. So it's not just for Catholics. It's for, for all Christians. But I'm talking to Catholics here as a precept. You must attend Mass on Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation, unless you have a good reason. You're, you're sick. You're taking care of a sick child. Oh, like in the old days, my mother was a registered nurse. And she was required sometimes to work on Sunday. They didn't have vigil masses back in those days. So she couldn't go to mass. It wasn't her fault. She wanted to. She just wasn't able to. But unless you have a good reason, you have to. Listen, objectively speaking, to miss mass without a good reason on Sundays and holy days of obligation is a mortal sin, a serious sin. That will extinguish Grace in the soul. Separate your relationship with God. Sever it. And you know the difference, of course, between a mortal sin and a venial sin? Very quickly. Number one, grave matter. This is grave matter. To miss Mass on Sundays or Holy Days of Obligation without a good reason, that's grave matter. Secondly, you have to have knowledge of that. If you didn't have knowledge before, now you do. Gotcha. Third, you have to give full consent of the will in the light of that knowledge. When those three elements are simultaneously in place, you have a mortal sin subjectively imputed if you don't have mitigating circumstances. I don't have time to go into that. Look it up in the Catechism if you want to research it further or, or check uh, on our uh, How to Make a Good Confession um, uh, video or audio. Four, honor your father and mother. Oh, most people do it, I think. They respect mom and dad. But, you know, in our generation, an awful lot of people did not actively have a father or a mother when growing up. An awful lot of single-parent families, um, maybe um, one parent or the other was abusive verbally, uh, even physically. Uh, and some, a lot of people have difficulty relating to this, or uh, uh, it, it, listen, do it. It's one of those things, you know, love is an act of the will. So, so is forgiveness. It's not a feeling. You know, you may say, I don't have any, I, I just don't have any feelings. I, I find it hard to honor my father or my mother. They neglected me. They abused me. They caused me a lot of problems. They, they were messed up. Forget all that. They brought you into the world, and they participated with God. They engaged in procreation. You received life. Mom and dad are special. Even if they weren't an exemplary parent, we should honor them. Uh, when you're young, of course, you've got to obey them. Uh, when, you know, you're, I have people sometimes 50, 60 years old ask me if they still have to obey their parents. 
Um, not necessarily, you know. Um, you got to exercise, you're an adult, exercise common sense. But you know, if mom tells you, look, you ought to stop living that sinful life, and mom is 80 or 90 years old, uh, and she's telling you the truth and you ignore it, well, you're ignoring it to your own peril. If you treat mom or dad with disdain for any reason, you know, you curse them, you uh, reject them, you cut them off, throw them out in a ditch, stick them in a nursing home and never visit them. Don't think you can be pleasing to God, because you can't. You know, there are an awful lot of elderly people today who are very much neglected. Uh, that they, they, they suffer the great cross of loneliness. Now, if you have a relative, a friend, or you know someone who's a shut-in, nursing home and so forth, by all means, bring some joy into their life. Visit them. Be kind to them. Number five, you shall not kill. Now, you know, the commandments go beyond just the words that are immediately evident. Um, yes, certainly that means murder. Now, does it mean any kind of killing? Well, you know, here's where, who's, who's qualified to interpret the Word of God? Only the church. The church is the authentic and authoritative interpreter of the Word of God, and I mean the magisterium of the church. And that's the Holy Father and the bishops united to him in teaching that faith which has been handed on to us faithfully throughout the ages. It always comes out, what about a soldier? A soldier in Iraq, he kills somebody, he's got to go to confess. And I mean, no, that, that is not a sin. If it's in the context of his job, if it's a police officer involved in a, in a gunfight, shoots a criminal, the criminal dies, is he guilty of a sin? No! No, he's not. That's not the sin. What's the sin? Taking the life of an innocent human being. In the context of uh, soldiering, military, or police work, uh, it, it, the, he's acting in good conscience, he's following orders, uh, and we're not talking about something like uh, what happened with Hitler. We're talking about in a, in a situation where we normally do, and this country by and large is very moral with that. Have innocent people been killed? Yes. Did, did, did the individual soldier, soldier necessarily, well, that, no. He was trying to do his job, follow orders, uh, as a um, secondary uh, effect of that. Uh, people died, so-called collateral damage. That's a horrible tragedy. But it's not necessarily a sin. The sin is taking the life, and remember, to have a mortal sin, grave matter, knowledge, and then full consent of the will. Abortion, would that be a sin against the fifth commandment? You better believe it. Abortion is taking the life of an innocent human being. And if you are a politician or anyone else who collaborates with, with that crime against humanity of abortion, you are participating in a grave sin. Uh, a politician who votes in favor of the so-called right to choose, which is the most incredible, preposterous, nonsensical uh, example of verbal engineering ever to come along. Uh, right to choose what? Right to choose to murder someone? Does any human being have that as a right? No. No one has such a right. Does a mother have the right to kill her unborn child? No. That is grave sin. Those who promote that in any way. Doctors who perform abortions, those who facilitate abortions, give money to organizations that promote abortion. That's grave sin. Grave sin. You can't approach the sacraments. You must go to confession and repent. If not, you're cut off from the body of Christ. As a matter of fact, there's a good chance you're excommunicated in virtue of the very act which you perform. Latte sententiae, excommunication. <laughs> the act in itself cuts you off. Thou shalt not kill. Uh, in, in, that <clears throat> in that category, there are a lot of other things too. Uh, hurting your health uh, knowingly and willingly. Smoking, excessive drinking, excessive eating. Can all be sins against the fifth commandment. 
Sixth commandment, a big one, thou shalt not commit adultery. That includes all sexual sins, not just adultery. That includes all sexual sins. Uh, and, it, and it would be a sin in general if it's outside marriage. Persons who are not married uh, uh, do not have the right to the use of the sexual faculty in accordance with the Ten Commandments. Seven, you shall not steal. And there's a lot of ways to steal. Um, you know, don't steal from your employer. Uh, don't steal from the government. There are all kinds of ways to steal. Don't steal people's ideas. Don't steal people's intellectual property. Um, all kinds of ways that we, we should be honest. Be honest. And you'll get further ahead. You won't have to steal. God will give you plenty of your own. Eight, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Now, this concerns all sins against truth, telling lies, um, calumny, slander, libel. Uh, so every one of these commandments, you can see, has a much broader spectrum than, than first uh, glance would indicate. Um, you don't want to do anything to hurt people. Uh, the sin of detraction, you know somebody sins, let's say. You know somebody's doing something wrong, uh, and you reveal that. You like to gossip, you tell that. That's a sin, the sin of detraction. You don't believe me, look it up in the catechism. Look up detraction in the index, and then read that. That can be a homework assignment. Now, the, uh, the obvious um, 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 exception to that rule is if, where there's, if someone's in danger, if someone's abusing children or something like that, you, you have an obligation to protect the innocent, by then you can you can go to the proper authorities, and 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 tell them, look, this person is uh, is doing very bad things and so forth. But in general, where that's not the case, um, no, you cannot do that. That's the sin of detraction. If you willfully, maliciously reveal the faults or sins of another. Nine and ten concern coveting uh, your neighbor's spouse, your neighbor's goods. That's an inordinate desire for what other people have. That can be keeping up with the Joneses, so to speak. You know, um, oh, it happens in this sick society, you know, uh, people have uh, trophy wives, so-called, trophy husbands. You know, they get the CEO uh, who makes several million dollars a year. That's a trophy. And then uh, the girlfriend says, oh, you know, well, I want one of those. Or uh, vice versa, the the husband who sees the um, the uh, you know the movie star looking beauty, uh, who uh, would make a good trophy wife. He's it's an egocentric thing. He'd like to show her off to all of his cronies at the at the country club or whatever. In, invariably, they get what they deserve, <laughs> which is uh, you know they they get a beating is what they normally get. I I actually know of. Women, and I'm sure there's men too, it's not one-sided, who collect such people. They, they, they have divorce lawyers who help them um, on a regular basis increase their net worth. That's all because of the disorder that took place from the beginning. You know, you don't, wanna, you don't want to uh, um, violate what's sacred. And, of course, marriage is sacred. So don't covet your neighbor's husband or wife. And don't covet, covet your neighbor's goods. Uh, a good way to live is to live in thanksgiving. Be thankful to God for everything you have. You may be poor, but you may be strong. You may not have a lot of money, but you may have good health. Uh, you may have good eyesight, good hearing, be able to read and write. Thank God for all the great things that he's given you. If you live in a spirit of thanksgiving, you, you, you won't have the, any problem with the ninth and 10th commandments. So learn the 10 commandments. I mean, you've got to memorize them and then study what each one of them means in the broader context. And then on a day-by-day -day basis, seek perfection. Uh, ask the Blessed Mother to help you. Uh, I, I say three Hail Marys every day that the Blessed Mother will help you to live in grace. Oh, you may have some favorite sins. Everybody has favorite sins, you know. Those, those are the ones you confess every time, you know. The ones that it seems time after time after time, we're always confessing the same thing. 
Ask Our Lady to help you just one day at a time. Just today, help me to not commit that sin. So day by day, make that examination of conscience using the Ten Commandments. And then on a regular basis, monthly, every two weeks, that's up to you. But on a regular basis, go to confession and receive God's sanctifying, purifying grace. If you'll do that, you'll be happy now and forever. God love you. God bless you. And goodbye. Greetings and God's blessing. This is Father John Corapi with Weekly Wisdom. I'd like to begin with a prayer, turning to Mary, our mother, asking for her intercession as we pray. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And we ask Our Lady to intercede with her divine spouse, the Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, come by means of the powerful intercession of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, your well-beloved spouse. Uh, We're in November now, and we spoke to you about uh, all saints and holiness in the first session. And we're going to talk about uh, All Souls Day. We know that's November 2nd, another uh, a major celebration on the church's liturgical calendar. Uh, it's the day where we traditionally uh, pray for the faithful departed, for the deceased. And I'm going to use it as an opportunity to um, <clears throat> help remind you, and, and if you've not really had the teaching before, give you a, uh, a, a short, synthesized teaching on uh, that branch of theology we called eschatology, which refers to um, the last things. Uh, Traditionally, uh, the church has taught on the last things, which are judgment, uh, purgatory, heaven, and hell. Um, I did a a little more complete series. If you're uh, interested in learning a little bit more uh, about this, we we did do a series uh, called Heaven and Hell, uh, which gives you a little more in-depth teaching on what I'll talk about here in just a few minutes. But uh, it's something that that every one of us has to be uh, concerned about, and we should be somewhat educated. It's fundamental, essential teaching uh, of the church. And um, so on this month of November where we, we do pray for our deceased relatives, friends, for all the faithful departed, um, We'll talk about that. Uh, What are these last things? Well, we know we're we're born, we live, and we die. As soon as we die, right after the moment of death, we have what's called a particular judgment. We stand before Christ, and in the light of Christ, the truth, uh, we give an account of our our whole life, that particular judgment. Uh, You don't have to wait to find out what your ultimate uh, destination is going to be. Now, ultimately, as the scriptures tell us, only two ways are set before us. Two ways are set before you, O man, uh, the way of life and the way of death. Uh, So of all the many, many paths a human being can take in the course of human existence, ultimately, there are only two destinations, heaven, hell. You win you lose. Now, purgatory is a stop on the way to heaven. Everyone who passes through purgatory, which is basically the final purification, and by the way, a doctrine of our faith. Now, uh, I'm I'm not, um, I I respect everybody's religion. I truly do. 
Uh, but I don't teach Buddhism, and I don't teach Hinduism, and I don't teach Islam, and I don't teach any of the other uh, Christian uh, confessions. I teach Catholic theology. And the part of the doctrine of the faith is the existence, the reality of purgatory. I'll read to you from, from the Catechism of the Catholic Church in, in a while on that. Uh, so the reality... Uh, of, a, of a particular judgment. That's a judgment you and I get in particular right at the end of our lives. So, the moment you die, boom, you're before Jesus, the just judge. Um, you, you've had your whole life to live a godly and upright life. Oh, you made mistakes. I made plenty of them. You fall on your face. You get up. Uh, you repent. Uh, you try to do the best you can. And at the end of your life, when you die, hopefully, you're going to be in a state of grace. A state of grace. That means you, are in a, you, ha, you have no serious sins on your soul at that moment. Uh, that means you've, if you're Catholic, you, you've uh, repented of your sins, gone to confession. Uh, hopefully, if you've had the opportunity, at least um, you've repented, uh, changed your heart, uh, and so you're in a state of grace. Let's say you, you are in a state of grace when you die. At that moment, the particular judgment, you're in a state of grace, but you have not atoned uh, for all of the sins which you've committed in your life. Um, remember in the scriptures, Jesus said every penny will be paid. And so let's say you go before uh, the judgment seat of God, and you have this particular judgment. You're not perfect. In other words, you haven't atoned for all the sins of your life. Uh, you haven't gotten a plenary indulgence, uh, which we'll speak of at another time. And so you have need of purification. Listen, you have to be perfect to stand in the immediate presence of God. You can't be imperfect, flawed by sin, and think you're going to stand in the immediate presence of God in heaven. Ain't going to happen. Lucky for us. There's purgatory. Lucky for us, there's purgatory. That's the final purification. It is not a negative thing. Uh, I've had all kinds of people, including some Catholics, uh, who've said to me, oh, I don't believe in purgatory. Well, don't boast what separates you from the church. Don't boast about that. It's a doctrine of the faith. You must believe in the existence of purgatory. As one old gal once said to me, well, they believe it when they get there. Well, that's for sure. Purgatory is real. Let me read to you from the Catechism of the Catholic Church a little bit on purgatory. You know, this comes up often enough that it's worth taking a moment here to read to you from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the Church's official teaching on purgatory. I start with uh, paragraph 1030 of the Catechism. All who die in God's grace and friendship but still imperfectly purified, are indeed assured of their eternal salvation. But after death, they undergo purification, so as to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. Look, folks, that's not bad news. That's good news. The church gives the name purgatory to this final purification of the elect, which is entirely different, entirely different, from the punishment of the damned or hell. Uh, the church formulated her doctrine of faith on purgatory, especially at the councils of Florence and Trent. The tradition of the church, by reference to certain texts of scripture, speaks of this cleansing fire. Now, it always comes up, people say, where does it say that in the Bible? It doesn't have to say it in the Bible. Because in the Catholic Church, we, we have two main fonts of revelation, sacred scripture and sacred tradition, and they're given equal weight. And then you have the magisterium of the church, which, which teaches definitively using those two fonts of revelation. But there are scriptural bases for this teaching. Uh, paragraph 1032 of the Catechism goes on, this teaching is based on the practice of prayer for the dead already mentioned in sacred scripture. Quote, Therefore Judas Maccabeus made atonement for the dead, 
that they might be delivered from their sin. That's in 2 Maccabees 12.46. That's one of the scriptural uh, references for the uh, church's teaching on purgatory. From the beginning, the church has honored the memory of the dead, as we do on All Souls Day, and offered prayers and suffrage for them, above all the Eucharistic sacrifice, so that thus purified, they may attain the beatific vision of God. The church also commends almsgiving, indulgences, and works of penance undertaken on behalf of the dead. We can pray for the deceased. We do pray for the deceased. <laughs> I remember once the, uh, uh, the mentor um, of the Quarry of Ars, St. John Vianney, once, once said uh, to uh, St. John, uh, hide my instruments of penance, his hair shirt, his discipline. Hide this because if people find it, they'll think I'm some kind of a saint and they'll leave me in purgatory till the end of the world. He was worried about that. He wanted people to pray for him. Um, I'm the same. Look, if I check out, please do me a huge favor. Pray for me. Uh, ask that Mass be said for my soul. Say the rosary for me. I'm not taking any chances, you know. We do the best we can. We try to live a good life in a state of grace and in accordance with God's will. I'm not perfect. Maybe you are, <clears throat> or think you are, but I know I'm not, and I'll bet you think, well, I'm not so perfect either. All right, we're very fortunate that if we don't make atonement for all the sins we commit throughout the course of our life, God has blessed us with this reality, and it is a reality, of purgatory. And so pray for your deceased relatives. Do it all the time. Have masses uh, said for them, especially All Souls Day, we, we do this, but you can do it uh, all along for your friends or in general for people who, who the, the, that have passed from this life into the next. Uh, pray for them. Offer your, your sacrifices, your rosaries, your masses uh, for the deliverance of the souls in purgatory. Look, th this used to be a, a commonly taught thing. Um, it's not so commonly taught anymore, but it ought to be. The teaching of the church hasn't changed. Purgatory is still there. It's part of the doctrine of the faith. And so that's, that's one of the last things, you know. We said the particular judgment. What happens, particular judgment? Um, purgatory, heaven, hell. Now, if you're in a perfect state of grace and all purification has been made, in other words, you've atoned, for all your sins. By the way, that can be done through prayers, through penances, uh, by, by, by indulgences, which is a gift the church gives to you. You should do certain works in accordance with the church's discipline, and you can receive a partial indulgence or a full indulgence. What does that mean, indulgence? Uh, that, that means remission of the temporal punishment due to sin. Say the rosary before the Blessed Sacrament. Go to confession, receive communion within, usually they say, eight days of, of the work, um, and then have no attachment to sin. Offer some prayers for the Holy Father's intention. You can receive that indulgence. Um, and then, after that particular judgment, okay, it's purgatory, it's heaven, or hell. Those, one of those three things. Purgatory, heaven, hell. Everybody who passes through purgatory goes to heaven. You make it to purgatory, partner, you're home free. You've made it. You're going to heaven. You're, you're, you're on your way to glory. Um, what about hell? That's the thing I least like to talk about. Um, it, it certainly is a negative thing, and we like to accentuate the positive, but we can't leave out the negative. You know what happens if you leave out the negative and you only have the positive? I use the analogy of an electrical current. What happens if all you have is the positive pole of an electrical current? What happens is nothing, nothing, no power. The lights go out, darkness falls. Indeed, if your light is darkness, how deep will the darkness be? 
And so the reality of these things, we, we don't like to talk about hell, but it's real. Well, who goes to hell? Those who want to. Okay? Does God ship people to hell? No. People decide to go there. God doesn't put anyone in hell. Uh, God loves the sinner. Scripture tells us God wills not the death of any sinner. God wills that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Well, what's the problem then? <laughs> We're the problem. We're the problem. Some people decide they don't want to love. They don't want to love God. They don't want to live, uh, love each other. They don't want to live in grace. So they reject God. They reject each other. They reject grace. And they live in sin. Uh, you need to know what sin is. You need to know the difference between mortal sin and venial sin. These are the subjects of other teaching, but certainly uh, you study the catechism. You can look at some of our other uh, programs. <coughs> know the difference between venial sin and mortal sin. All right, hell is a reality. Those who go to hell are those who do not live in a state of sanctifying grace and die that way. Let's say you've, uh, <coughs> you've lived in sin all your life. But before you die, you're fortunate enough to have time, and you repent of your sins. You ask God for his mercy. Uh, at that, do you go to hell? No. No. The repentant do not go to hell. Uh, those who go to hell are only those who want to, who are obstinate to the end. Uh, one of the questions I've often gotten is a question on a passage from Scripture that talks about the unforgivable sin, the sin against the Holy Spirit. And people uh, are always uh, feel, oh, I think I've committed that sin. I did this, I did that. And they think that they're guilty of the unforgivable sin. And, and they never are because the people who write are alive, they're not dead. And so the, let me tell you, the only unforgivable sin is final impenitence. <clears throat> Every other sin you can forgive. God will forgive. Uh, people have said to me, oh, I had an abortion, Father. Is that the unforgivable sin? No. Repent of it. Ask for God's mercy. If you're Catholic, you go to confession. The priest gives you absolution. Um, um, you're forgiven. The only unforgivable sin is final impenitence. That means you go right to your death, obstinately refusing to repent. That's all. So what's the remedy? Repentance. God's mercy is far bigger than all the sin in the universe. From beginning to end, from the original sin to the last sin that will ever be committed. If you took it all, uh, condensed it, distilled it, and synthesized it, it would be less than a drop in the ocean of God's mercy. And I'm not minimalizing sin. It's horrible. It's horrible. We need to be, to, to, to be serious about sin. But I'm just trying to emphasize to you, God's mercy is bigger than your sins, or mine, or all the sin in the universe. And so, please know that. And so, when, when we recall these last things uh, in the month of November, because we, we have All Souls Day on November 2nd, and we're, we're reminded and encouraged by the church and the liturgical calendar to pray for the deceased, to pray for the faithful, Departed. Recall these things. The particular judgment. That's the, the judgment the moment you die. The instant you die, you go before Christ and you're, you've got to give account of everything you've done and failed to do. Particular judgment. And then what? Well, then there's purgatory, which is a great blessing because that's the, that's a, that allows us to be purified of any of that temporal punishment that attaches to us due to sin. And then this, the ultimate destination is the ultimate state of being for all eternity, forever. Remember, a hundred billion years is less than the first second of eternity. Remember that. Then there's heaven or hell forever. Heaven, the beatific vision. Uh, eye has not seen nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the mind of man what God has in store. 
for those who love him. Heaven, oh, it's, it's something unimaginable, so beautiful, so fantastic. And hell, a horror you can't imagine either. And it's our choice. God doesn't ship us to one place or the other. We decide freely and intelligently. We have an intellect. We have a free will. And we use them. And we decide where we want to be forever. Forever. Heaven or hell. That's the frightening reality uh, of free will. God has endowed us with free will. We decide to love or not to love. To obey or not to obey, to embrace the light or the darkness, good or evil. But I know that you'll go the right way. I know you want to do the right thing. Oh, we're not perfect. We fight it out. We run the race to the finish line. But then if you do that, seriously, I, I promise you, as I've said so many times, at the end, you'll be happy you walk the straight and narrow path because you'll hear these beautiful words, well done, my good and faithful servant, now at last enter into the joy of your master's house. That's heaven. God bless you. God love you. And goodbye.